Welcome, everybody, to today's episode of Rel Presents. And uh, you'll you'll recognize that I am not Eric. However, this is still Brian Smith, so there's still a good a good level of familiarity, right? <laughs> how are you doing, uh, today, Nate? How, how, how do you feel, Brian? It's it's like everybody bailed on us this week. I know, I know. Eric yeah. bailed, so here I am, and and the guests bailed. So, <laughs> yep, yep. I shouldn't say bailed, postponed. So, right, right. Um, you, anybody who was expecting the interview with OnLogic, that's still going to happen. It's going to happen in June. So just keep that in mind. OnLogic will be at Summit, though. And so will me and Brian and the rest of the REL team. So if you want to come out and say hi at Summit, that's the end of this month. So, yeah. How you doing today, Brian? Yeah, doing pretty well. How about you, Nate? Oh, not too bad. It's been a hectic week. I don't know. <laughs> All right. So, you know, when put on the spot, you know, Brian will always talk about one of two things. Right, Brian? That's right. Yeah. <laughs> web, web, Today console, we're gonna talk or, about, yeah web console or system roles, right? <laughs> Today, we're going to talk about one of those things. And I don't know. We'll see if he works in the other. Yeah, uh, we we're going to be chatting about uh, web console today. So yeah. um, web console is a pretty neat tool. I come from an era where uh, uh, the idea of administering your Linux boxes through a web portal was very frowned upon. <laughs> Web console isn't that though. It's, it's it's actually a really nice tool, and we're, we're going to dig a little more into that as uh, as we go today. So, I don't know. I we as much as we talk about Web console, it's it's like we haven't really covered it in depth on Rel Presents. So uh, so Brian, why don't why don't we start like what what is Web console for anyone who's who's like what is this thing that Nate's talking about? Yeah yeah so. So the Rel Web Console, which is also known as Cockpit, which is the upstream project that it, that we base the Web Console off of, it's a it's a web-based management interface for for managing Rel, right? So what that means is um, it's an alternative to the command line. So you you can go to a web-based web-based interface, and <clears throat> you know I'd say at this point you can do the vast majority of your normal day-to-day -day system admin type task right from you know the the convenience of a web console um so and if, you, if you haven't looked at the web console in, in a few years too like you might be you might be shocked at like how much functionality and features have been added in over the last few years we've, we've really been putting a lot of focus on this a lot of effort into it and uh there's just there's just a lot of great stuff in there but but and, there, and there's a lot of different use cases you know where, where this might be you know useful and we'll, we'll talk about a lot of these later on um, you know, there's a lot of things from the from the command line that are, you know, harder to do. Like if you want to pull up a, a console on a virtual machine, for example, that's, you know, over SSH, that, that can be, you know, pretty challenging to do. So there's a lot of things like that that the web console really, um, really works well for. And um, another another use case that we see um, for the for the web console is um, using a, a mobile a mobile phone browser to connect to your rel system so so nate you were you were a system admin before right in your pre okay so Absolutely. i would imagine my, like most imagine, of my career before coming to red hat was systems administration <laughs> yeah 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 and me, me as well so and i spent many many years in like an on-call situation I, I don't know about you mm -hmm. but yeah so absolutely <laughs> and i always i always felt personally like really um tied to my laptop Right, like yeah, you'd either right. have to have a laptop with you, uh, and then of course a laptop implies that you'd have to have some way to get onto the internet. Yeah, right? so yeah. you'd have to be at at a place that offered Wi-Fi, or you'd have yeah, to have exactly. a way to tether to your phone. Yeah, yeah, and I always felt like you know, hey, I can't go for a bike ride, I can't go out for a hike because I don't want to lug the laptop around and stuff. So, yep. so anyways, so wouldn't it be nice though if from your from your mobile phone, if you could connect to to a rel system and you know reset a user password, expand the file system. Um, restart a service, you know, all, all, all those common things you do when you're on call, right? So so that is one option you can do with a web console as well as, um, you know, right from your mobile phone, connect connect into a, a system and, and, and manage yeah, it. So, and the, the cool thing that, I, that I've seen with web console is, you know, a lot of times a GUI, right, will feel limiting, right? Like there's things, there's just a whole lot of power you get at a command line that GUIs have trouble capturing all of it because it's like, well, if we put that all in there, then it's the GUI becomes unusable. If we don't put it all in there, then it's not 
usable enough, right? There's not, it's not useful enough. So there's always those limitations where it's like this little edge case. Well, Web Console solves that by literally giving you the option to go to a command prompt. Right. You, you can, if you can't find it in the GUI, you, if, if you know how to do it at the command prompt, you can still get there, which is pretty cool. Yep. Yep, exactly. And another, you know, another thing that can be challenging to do from the command line is like looking at like uh, historical performance information. Like, you know, what, what's the graph of my CPU usage or memory usage, right? Pretty, pretty hard to do um, from the command line. Whereas if you have a, <clears throat> a graphical tool, like, like web console, um, you know, that's, an, that's another use case where you can go in there and, and, and really dig in to performance, see when resources have spiked, that, that kind of stuff. And we'll, and we'll show more of this later on when we, when we go into a demo, but, uh, yeah, just lots okay. of lots of really exciting things. And then one thing you mentioned is, um, y you know, it's it's not an either or. If if you are managing rail, you don't have to either use the command line or use the web console, right? You can you can use right. a mixture of both. And one nice thing about the web console is, um, it's not like maintaining a separate database of of configuration or the state of the system in the web. It's it's just it's just you, you know calling APIs on the system to or, or you know to, to make changes, right? So you can switch between the web console and, and terminal um, or you can have you know a, a team where some people use web console, some people use the terminal and 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 that's you know that's not really a problem. So yeah that's that's another case, right? Uh, how many times have you gone into a config file via the command line and at the very top, there's this warning that says this tool, this is managed by tool X. Don't right. touch it. Right. Right. Well, right. That, exactly. That's not the case with Web Console. Right. Exactly. Which is which is pretty cool. Exactly. Um, uh, another great benefit, right? Uh, Linux can be hard sometimes, right? And it, and as an administrator, you will always, almost always, have that 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 new guy to the team, right? Mm -hmm. That is still learning, right? Nothing against that guy, that girl, whatever, but. Um, you know, they just they don't have the the skill set that maybe the the gray beards do, <laughs> right? <laughs> Web console is a great way to bridge that gap too, which is exactly. which is really nice, right? It was really difficult to do that back in the older days, right? Um, yeah, yeah, no, I totally agree. Than maybe handing somebody a, a you know a, a machine that still had a GUI on it, right? Right. And even then, the tools weren't always great. Right, and 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 a lot of a lot of especially like smaller teams. That are supporting systems, you might have a, a mixture where you have, you know, a couple of people focus on Linux, a couple of people focus on on other operating systems, like you know, Windows perhaps. Yeah. And and you know, like uh, you know, those you know those people focus on other areas might need to cover the Linux systems, you know, like after yeah. hours on call during a rotation, or or maybe you just want to enable them to take care of some issues themselves, so they don't have to go you know go through you to expand a file system or something like that. So if you have people who are not super familiar with Linux or just getting started or their focus is on another IT area, you can, you know, provide them access to the web console and, and um, you know, really get them up to speed and effective at, at doing these normal day-to-day -day tasks much, much, much faster than you could if you were trying to teach them the command line way to do all, all of these different tasks. Yeah. I've been in those mixed shops before. In fact, uh, I worked at this little web host where we had one guy that did Windows and then me who did Linux stuff. And when you're sharing on-call rotations and stuff, that's hard, right? It was it seemed relatively easy for me to hop into a Windows machine to do administrative tasks, but it wasn't always as easy for him to go the other way. So right. yeah, a tool like this would definitely have helped that. Yep, exactly, exactly. And then you know another 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 use case that, that people use the web console for is. Um, you know, containers. Um, there's there's a there's mm -hmm. a Potman application within the web console um, where you can you know you can manage your your Potman containers. You know, create new containers, download container images, etc. Um, and, and and you know, one thing I want to mention as well um, is um, you know, web console is is modular, right? So you can install the pieces that you'd like to use. So for example, like if you're not going to be you know running Podman containers or virtual machines, you don't have to install that portion of the web console. Right. You can just leave that off completely. Right, right. Containers is a great example, and so is virtualization, right? Um, anyone who's run virtualization on RHEL should be familiar with libvirt and the virsh command line, which is really powerful. There's a lot of stuff you can do with it. Um, it, like everything that has a lot of power available to it, though, it sometimes is not intuitive and it's not easy to work with. Um, you used to have a tool called, uh, or I should say, we used to have a tool called Vert Manager, 
which is now deprecated. It's not gone yet. You can still use it like a lot of things that are deprecated, but it will eventually go away, right? So there had to be a replacement for that. And the cockpit web console stuff is, I mean, it's great, right? It, there's, I, I, uh, I came from a rev background, right? I ran that in my home lab for a little while, decided that the footprint was just a little too heavy for, for the size of machines that I have running here. So I went back to a libvirt hosted rail box and um, being able to manage that through web console, it's, I mean, I would say it's almost as good as any, any enterprise level, you know, virtualization platform, except that it doesn't do the, the clustering piece or does it, is there clustering built in? I don't think there is. No, yeah, no, yeah, that's a good point. So the web console is focused on on individual individual host management. So when it comes to like virtual machines, it, it's focused on that of use case of of running virtual machines on a single host, not 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 a cluster. But but yeah, but like well, like you mentioned, yeah, Vert Manager deprecated. The recommended tool for for managing you know KVM virtual machines on Rel is is the web console. So um, so right, and it. Yeah. And it shows because it re it works really well. I got to say, yeah, exactly, <laughs> yep, exactly, exactly. So, and uh, along with virtualization goes networking. Uh, the, the tool that manages networking through Network Manager through Web Console is also quite good. I mean, I I can remember the days of trying to fight with the order of operations for setting up a bridge to right. a VLAN in right. Rel. Uh, you know, you've got your interface, you've got the bridge interface, you've got the VLAN interface. Which one goes first? Which one points where? Well, the web console makes that all really simple. Yeah, yeah. If you've ever set up a, a network network bridge or network team from the command line, right? You're, you're gonna you're gonna love the web console. <laughs> it's right. so much easier. Right. All right, so um, you've got something of a demo, don't you? Do we want to head on into that now, or uh, you got anything else you want to tout before we move on? Yeah, yeah. Let me just so let's just talk a little bit about kind of the different ways you can run the web console and and some different oh, ways sure. you, you can connect to it because you know one one um, one thing people have concerns about is like you know look I don't want to run another like a web server on all my rel hosts. To enable this, right? The the you know right. the web console has it's it's called the cockpit web server, um, that that runs it, it, by default. It listens on port ninety ninety, and um, and so there's a lot of people who are like, hey, I don't want to run, I don't want to run this, I don't want to open another port on my systems, right? Um, for you know for a number of, of pretty good reasons. So so the good news is you don't have to do that. That's just one way you can run the web console is is using the cockpit web server, right? There are several other methods you can use to connect into the web console, um, basically over an SSH connection. So you don't have to have the web server running. You don't have to have that port 9090 open or any of that. So I just wanted to briefly just, just cover these um, to make sure people are aware of them. So there's three three main methods you can use to connect um, connect to the web console um, over over SSH. So so the the first one I'll talk about is there's an integration with satellite. So if you're using Red Hat Satellite in your environment, which which a lot of people are, um, you can go in and there's an optional um, uh, web console integration you can enable um, from 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 the satellite perspective. Once you've done that, you just go into satellite, you pull up the host you'd like to connect to, and there's a web console button. You click on the web console button, and it automatically logs you in using the remote execution SSH keys that are already set up as part of satellite. And you're you're basically automatically logged in to the to the system, you know, into the web console. So very very convenient, very easy to use, and that's all the traffic is going over SSH. No need to have the the cockpit web server running or even installed. You just have to have the um, the, the base cockpit packages installed on the remote host, but not the not the web server portion of it. So that's, that's pretty, pretty cool. great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so another method you can use is what we refer to as a bastion host. Okay. So so when you use this method, you need you need to have you know one one system running the cockpit web server. Okay, so you know like one bastion host. You connect into that host, you know, over the port ninety ninety like you normally would. But from there, you can go in and add um, add connections to additional hosts. You know, one or more additional hosts, and those connections are going to go over SSH. So all the hosts you add in to your bastion host, um, you don't have to have the web server running on any of those because all of that's going to go over the SSH uh, protocol. So that's that's another method to do it. And then finally, the, um, the another method you can use connect to, to connect over SSH is the um, cockpit client flat pack. 
So um, this is this is not supported by Red Hat, but this is available if you'd like to use it. So if you're using a Linux um, desktop or workstation, you can install the Cockpit Client Flatpak. Um, you, you open that up and you basically type in a server name you'd like to connect to, and it will um, connect directly over SSH, and um, you can you know manage the host using the web console from there. So so I just want to mention there are lots of different options if if you don't want to run the web server on, on your host. Yeah, that the so I have a couple quick comments. First of all, that Bastion host sounds really nice because it means you log in one place, right? And right. then you can connect to the other subsystems. I assume there's some exchange of authentication. It, that doesn't just like it must pass through something, right? Yeah, yeah. So you can um, when you connect to the remote host using that method, um, you, it, it basically will offer to set you up an SSH key if you don't already have one, or if you already have an existing SSH key. Um, public key authentication setup, it'll, it'll, it'll log in using that. So, so yeah, it's all based on the SSH public key authentication that, that uh, you know, a lot of people are familiar with already. Right. That's cool. That's cool. And then of course, satellite uses its own internal uh, remote execution stuff. That's, that's pretty nice yep. that the, the cockpit web application itself, the web server that runs as a socket, right? Not, not an, not a full service. Does that mean it's, it starts it up on the fly? So it's not always yeah. running in the background. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So if you are, if you are running the cockpit web server, so you have the, the cockpit dash WS package installed. Um, yeah. You enable the, um, the cockpit socket, which is a system D unit, like you're saying. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's not, it's not using any resources unless somebody is logged in, right? Cause system D right. is basically, you know, listing on, on port 9090, when it gets a connection, then it will spin up the, the cockpit. Because there's there's two things I always worry about when a service is running. One of them is the memory footprint and the, the you right. know the utilization that it's going to put on my the load it's going to put on my system. And then the other, of course, is the security. Yeah. Uh, we kind of address that address the security piece by talking about how it communicates and how you don't even need that service if you don't want it. Yep. Um, but it, we also you know the it's it's not consuming much of anything when it's when you're not actively using yeah. it which is which yeah. is pretty cool I yeah like it's that. extremely lightweight and um yeah if you're not if you're not logged in it's really not using any resources it's kind of the only exception like it, there's so there's some metrics you can enable using performance copilot that's obviously running in the background if you use that functionality but right that's, it's not right. that's not a requirement if you don't you know right so obviously the the things that it talks to Right. right. They're their own. They're their own entities, exactly. right? whether exactly. it's the, the, the performance co-pilot data or the services that you're managing or the virtual machines that you're managing. Right. Those are all separate. Right. I mean, the, the the service itself, you know, the, the exactly. web server, exactly. even if you have it there, it's not it's not actively doing much unless right. unless you're interacting with it. So right. exactly. Pretty neat. Pretty neat stuff. Uh, and all of this is, you know, possible because of the stuff that System D brought to us. So, you know, yep. go back to the. The episode we had with Ben about System D. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> system D, and I learned a lot with that with that uh, episode with Ben. Yeah. So if, yeah, if anyone didn't see that, fun. go go check out the recording. That was that was a good one. Yep. Yep. All right. So yeah, pretty cool stuff. I like. Um, it, it it took me a minute to 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 get used to the idea that I could manage a system with with uh, with a web interface, and not not. Um, sort of intrinsically be opposed to it <laughs> because of my <laughs> my uh, old school upbringing right, right but right. i gotta say it's it's a really nice tool i i put it on I, i'm not going to say i put it on every server i manage now but i put it on especially that hypervisor and a number of other right. things because it's, yep. it's just so handy it's so yep. handy. I, I'm, I'm the same way yep yep so yeah do we want to you want right. to bring up my screen and we can show off some of yep. this stuff? here we go all right, cool. So I want to I want to start by um, showing some stuff that is is new in RHEL 9.2 beta and 8.8 .8 beta, which were okay. released um, a little bit ago. So this is a 9.2 beta system. Um, so um, you know, just just at a high level, though, you know, I'm, I'm logged in here. Um, you can see over on the left, we have a menu of of all kinds of different stuff. We'll go through all of this later. Um, and you can see, um, I'm, 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 I'm starting here on this overview screen. Okay. Um, let me go back to this screen. This, so this is an overview of kind of a, a high level of the, what's going on in the system. So let's start by talking about one of the things I'm most excited about with, with the uh, 9.2 beta and 8.8 beta. So that is, there's now a dark theme mode. So, you know, a lot of people prefer 
you know, using a dark visual theme for a number of different reasons. And so if you would like to use that, you can just go up here to the session dropdown. Um, you have this default. So by default, it'll try to detect if your operating system is configured for a dark theme and it'll automatically, you know, select that if it, if it you know, can detect that. Or you can go through and just override and say, I'd like to use, you know, either the light theme or the dark theme. So I'll go ahead and switch over to the dark theme. So that that's now available. So that's cool. That's pretty, that's pretty great. I mean, that's some people think, oh, big deal. Everyone's everyone's adding dark mode to their their applications now. What's you know, why? Why? Why should I care about that? I've always preferred dark mode, but that's just a preference. Some people, this is literally an unaccessibility thing. Yeah, like their exactly. their eyes have trouble with the light colors, and they're better with the dark colors. Yep. So yep. you know, it's it's great yep. that that's added. Yep. Yep. Um, and so another thing um, I wanted to highlight on, on this screen here is if you go down to the configuration section here, we have the crypto policy section. So this is referring to the system-wide uh, crypto policy. Um, this is a feature that we introduced in RHEL 8 originally um, that basically allows you to, instead of having to go through and you know manually configure these really complex crypto, crypto settings for each of the applications that we include in RHEL, um, you can instead just set it, set it at the system level. So this is this is really nice. And um, we, we introduced this into the web console a couple of releases ago, but we, we enhanced this even further um, in, in, in the beta releases here. And what we did is, you know, you have the main policies like the default, legacy, future, but then we also added in the ability to select some of the policy modifiers that are, are frequently used. So for example, you know, you have the default policy and then you have the default um, with SHA-1 allowed, right? So if you if you want to use the default, but for whatever reason, you know, maybe you're talking to some legacy systems, you need to also have, you know, SHA-1 available, um, you can you can do that. And there's other ones, like if you want legacy with Active, Active Directory support, you know, et cetera, you can now have more, you know, basically more flexibility in, in, what, in what you choose here. So that's pretty cool. That's handy. All right, let's jump down. You can set things like TuneD profiles and uh, as well, can't you? I, yeah. I was just with that on my own system the other day because I was having some performance issues and I just wanted to see where it was set. I thought that was handy that it was right there in the web console. I'd never even realized it was there to begin with, but there it is. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So these are the yeah these are the uh, the TuneD profiles. So yeah, if you'd like to set one of those, um, super easy to do. You can also you know go through you know do things like configure the time, host name. You, know, you can even join join a domain, <clears throat> all that and good stuff. Is that is that an IDM domain, or can it also join something like Active Directory through that? Yeah, you know, that's a good question. I th I think this is. I think it's IDM, but I'd have to double check. Feels like IDM. Yeah, I'd have to. Double I, didn't, check. I didn't mean to try to distract you there, but <laughs> I was just kind of curious. <laughs> that's okay. I'll have to I'll have to follow up on that. I, I want to say it's IDM, but I'm not a hundred percent sure on that. That's yeah. It would make sense that it would be IDM. Active right. Directory requires a little more work to. Right. Anyway, all right. And and these but, aren't necessarily new features. This is just me distracting poor Brian right. during his demonstration of new features. <laughs> that's a good. That's a good. That's a good tie-in though, which is system roles, because in in the in the nine point two beta and eight point eight beta, we 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 do have a new um, system role to help you integrate with Active Directory. So if you want to do mm -hmm. that and you want to do it at scale, check out the, the new Active Directory integration um, system role in the beta. That, um, that wasn't scripted, guys. He he just <laughs> he he just knows so much about the system roles that he he knew right where to work that in. <laughs> so so I'm gonna go through all the new stuff and then I'll jump back and I'll cover I'll go through more of this sure. other stuff. Um, all right. Uh, so let me jump down. The next thing I want to talk about that's new is if you go down to the accounts um, section here, there is um, now the ability to manage groups. So if if you um, looked at a you know previous release, there was no ability to to list out the groups or create new groups, etc. So you can now expand this drop down. You can see all the groups on the system. Um, <clears throat> you can create new groups if you'd like. Um, and then that's another handy. thing. Yeah, yeah, go ahead, Nate. I was just gonna say that's that's handy because I, I I remember this coming up in a conversation. I, I can't even remember the context anymore, but they someone asked, why can't I manage users and groups through yep. Web Console? And and here it is. Yep. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, and, and before we had some limited ability to manage accounts. So if if you look at an old version, you'll see when you, when you go to this page, there'll be all the accounts listed, and each account is like a separate card here in the interface. 
And so if you had a mm -hmm. lot of user accounts, it was kind of hard to, to see them all or search and find them. So there's now this, this new like improved list of accounts and you can do things like you can search for groups, you can, you know, sort them by different attributes. And then, you know, going along with the groups, I can now pull up a user account. And if I'd like to add, you know, add this account to a different um, Linux group, I can, you know, now very easily do that. Whereas before this was not available. So, so lots of cool, yeah, lots, lots of cool stuff there. And then, you know, obviously, you know, one of the really common tasks you, you would have as, as a system admin is going in and doing things like resetting passwords. Yeah. Um, you know, stuff like that. So that's all, that's all super easy to do. Uh, Billy locked himself out again. We got to go get him unlocked <laughs> or yeah. Oh, forgot his password. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. exactly. So, all right, cool. So let's, uh, let's keep going here. So let's go up to uh, virtual machines. So we, we, you know, made some improvements here in the beta I wanted to cover. Um, you know, like, like we mentioned, Virtual machines is an area we're putting a lot of focus in on since this is now the recommended, you know, tool to manage virtual machines. Mm -hmm. So, um, so let me go. I, so I'm in the network section. Let me go back to virtual machines. So you can, you know, you can obviously go in here and manage things like the storage pools, the virtual mm -hmm. networks. Um, and I have one uh, virtual machine running here, Fedora. Uh, so I'm going to click on this. Um, you can see you can easily um, you know access the console. Um, yep. For this virtual machine, super convenient to do. And that's that's the key here, right? This this is the thing that you need a tool for, right? Because Versh can get to the console on a VM, but only in a text manner. Right. right? So if, if you need a graphical console, it's this, or you need to like connect to VNC, or in the old days it was Spice, you know now it or it was Vert Manager. Right. Yep. So when Vert Manager got deprecated, we needed an alternative specifically for that. Right. And it's great that it's built right in here. And it's it's so easy to use. You can just like expand it. It becomes a larger screen. So it makes it easier to uh, to deal with. Exactly. So so some of the new stuff in the beta that you'll notice. Number one is um, you can now um, add <clears throat> add a virtual watchdog device. So this is this is important um, if you are. Um, working with like the high availability add-on, um, you know, this is a way uh, you, you can use a watchdog device to help with fencing the system. So, so if you're oh, if you're dealing with cool. yeah, so if you're dealing dealing with with that kind of configuration, you need a virtual watchdog device. Um, now now possible to add that right from, right from the web console, and of course you have yeah. all the other all the other common you know memories, um, CPUs, boot order, you know, all the stuff you would expect. I I feel like most people overlook the fact that you can use the high availability add-on for RHEL to manage virtual guests the same way you would any other service, right? In fact, that was my introduction to the RHEL HA add-on way back. I built clusters uh, to, ran, to run VM specifically, oh, nice. right? Nice. A, a lot of people forget that that's even... Cause everyone's like, oh, I just use this to do my databases, right? Well, it'll, it'll work for lots of other services, and right. VMs is one of them. Right. And then... Another another thing I want to highlight. This is this is kind of a little thing, but pr pretty handy. And that is, if you are you know have a virtual CD-ROM device on on the system, and you have like an ISO image loaded into it, you know previously you had to have the virtual machine shut down if you wanted to like eject that ISO image and load a different ISO image into that virtual CD-ROM device. So it's kind of kind of yeah. yeah. You can now. I thought that was weird. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So you can now. It's not you know, weird anymore. <laughs> yeah. You so now from you know like you would expect from a from a, a VM that's up and running, you know on yeah. the fly you can eject the ISO, load a new ISO. So that that's that's pretty pretty handy. And it's just these little quality of life things that keep coming to this that uh, it's really nice to see, right? Exactly. Uh, like I said, it was it was I I thought it was kind of strange that you couldn't eject it, and I'm I'm yeah. glad that, that that's added now. Yep, and then, and then just looking through the rest of the stuff. So you know, you can obviously you can manage like virtual network devices if you want to add in a new um, virtual network adapter into the VM. You can do that. Um, you can pass through things like um, PCI and USB um, devices from your host, which is pretty hmm. handy. <clears throat> and then um, you know, if you want to work with uh, snapshots, you know, you can you know create create new snapshots. And then yep. you can also enable um, a shared directory um, between the host and the VM. And this is, uses the vert IOFS 
um, technology. So, so lots of different, lots of different functionality here. Um, and, you know, I would, I would also say like, if there's, if, if you're using, if you're using the web console to manage virtual machines and there's anything that's missing that you'd like to see, please reach out to me. I, you know, I'd love to get that feedback, you know, really on anything in the web console, but in particular things like the virtual machine management, you know, we're looking for feedback on. So, and I know, I know Nate, you, you've done a lot with, with virtual machines. Is, is there anything you want to add that, that you've done with the web console and virtual machines? I think you've uh, you've you've covered it pretty well here, um, and and some of the things that I thought were issues you just you just showed me are being fixed, which is pretty cool. Um, but yeah, the 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 only other piece that um, that I find myself using a lot, and that's mainly because of the way I have things set up, is how I can also use the networking tab over there on the side to configure the the not just the virtual networks, but like bridge networks and whatnot through oh, yeah. the network manager networking, right? That's that's really handy. Now, obviously, Network Manager, even at the command line, makes it a lot easier than it used to be. It used to be these flat files that were really hard to keep track of in your brain uh, and and deal with. Um, Network Manager makes that a lot easier. But the web the web console plugin for networking takes it to a new level of easier, <laughs> right? Which is great. The ability to set up bridges and VLANs and and all that, exactly. uh, and then your virtual machines just see them and they're they're usable. Right. So you can just go to go back to your virtual machines after adding a bridge and boom, there's your bridge. You can add it as a network. Yep. So exactly. pretty cool stuff. All right. Well, cool. There's a, there's a few, few more things I want to talk about that's new and then we'll, and then we'll kind of go through everything else. So um, let me jump over to storage. So, you know, one, one technology we have in Realm, and this is one of my favorite features is network bound disk encryption. I, I, I know you, I know you're familiar with this technology and I think you, you, you yep. guys did a, did an episode of into the terminal on this, right? Okay. Yep. Uh, two weeks ago, I think that was, yeah. Yeah. So, um, so, um, you know, at a high level for people who are not familiar with this, um, if you have a, like, for example, a Lux encrypted root file system, the main challenge with this is every time you reboot the host, it's going to stop, you know, stop booting and prompt you to type in the Lux, the Lux passphrase, right? Right. This, this is um, a big problem if you have like a thousand rel systems and you want to do something like patch them every month. You know, if you, right. you, you patch a thousand systems, you, you reboot them, you have a thousand systems literally stopping and waiting for somebody to type in the Lux, Lux passphrase on the console. Um, and this is, you know, historically in my experience has been the reason why a lot of people just don't bother using yeah. Lux encryption, especially on the root file system, right? Because it's just, it's just unmanageable to have to deal with this. And so we, we uh, introduced network bound disk encryption to address this specific problem. And, and what this does <clears throat> is, is basically you, you set up in your environment a what's called a Tang server. And then on, on the client side, you, you set up the, the Clevis client. And, and essentially it, what it does is um, when, the, when the system boots up, it will reach out and try to connect to the Tang server over the network. And as long as it's able to establish that connection and there's you know, some you know, cryptography stuff going on there, as long as it can establish that, that network connectivity, um, the, the, at a high level, the, the RHEL system can um, automatically unlock the system and boot up without user inter interaction. You know, it, obviously the protocol is a lot more complicated than, than that. That's just a simple yeah. version of, of how it works. And so this really this really helps ad address this problem. And 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 the theory the, the the theory behind how all this working is, um, you know, if somebody were to you know come in your environment and steal you know steal a hard drive or you lose a hard drive or you lose a system, lose a laptop, you know something like that, you know you lose control of a, of a, a hard drive or a system one way or the other, um, and um, you know somebody takes that and tries to you know get the information off of it. Um, the Tang server, your Tang server is behind your, you know, your corporate firewall. Um, the person who who stole the device or whatever, they don't have the ability to connect to that Tang server, and so the system, the you know, the information is still encrypted, it's still secure. It, um, it's, right. Is a high level how this works. And there's there's like two two quick use cases that expand on that that make this even more useful. One of which is if if your machine can't reach the Tang server, it doesn't just lock the disk and make it completely unusable, it asks you for the password. So imagine if you're like a, a, a laptop or something, right? You're on, you're on premises, you're working, you turn on your, you know, whatever, you turn on your machine, it just unlocks automatically, you can start doing your job. 
if you pick it up and walk to Starbucks and turn it back on, now you can still get back into your machine. You just have to type in the password, yep. right? Which is really exactly. handy, I think. Like, that's a really exactly. nice thing. And exactly. the other thing is, um, if you ever worked in a data center, eventually a server has reached its end of life and you need to get rid of it, right? Now, what do you do with those hard drives? But you have to do something to make sure there's no private information on there. Well, if it's encrypted, it's effectively unreadable anyway, right? So that's, you know, the first step in making sure that it's unreadable is having it encrypted in the first place. If you still want to shred it or whatever to be certain, go right ahead. But um, it makes it a lot harder for you to accidentally let data leak your data center by sending a machine to the recycler, right? Yeah, ex exactly. Yeah, exactly. So, so with all that background, so, so <laughs> yeah, all that so, to say, yeah, yeah so the, um, so the web console, you know, you can go in and if you, you know, say you have a, a Tang server and you want to, you know, bind one of your Lux encrypted volumes to the Tang server, you could do that before um, in the web console if it was like a, um, you know, a non-root file system, like you had like, a, you know, a different file system for your application or, or, or whatever, you could do that. Um, if you wanted to do it for the root file system, um, the web console could only help you a little bit. And then there are a lot of steps you had to do from the command line. Well, what we've done in the beta is um, 8.8 and 9.2 beta is we've addressed this and you can now, you know, for the root file system, go in and bind to a Tang server and the web console will take care of all the, all the stuff that needs to happen, you know, automatically for you. So, so to do that, you can pull up um, the, uh, the uh, Lux encrypted partition. You, know, you go to the encryption tab here. Um, you'll see down here you have the different keys. And so, so like you mentioned, Nate, so the, you know, this pass phrase is in slot zero. So this is the ability that you, you, you'll, you, you know, I would still have the ability to use this pass phrase um, as, a, as a backup if the tank server is not available. Um, but then I can go in and, and in addition, add in a new key. So click the plus sign here and I can specify a tank server, you know, just put in, um, put in the, the uh, URL for my, for my tank server, the uh, current Lux passphrase um, for, for the encrypted device, and it will go ahead and bind to that Ting server and take care of everything that needs to happen to enable this to work when the system boots up. So it's so pretty cool that that is now now available. Yeah, that's pretty great. It's pretty great. Now, I've, I've toyed with the system role, which was really nice. This makes it even nicer, right? It just takes these... Yeah complicated tasks and makes them very simple, yeah, right? Exactly. So that's that's pretty good stuff. So this assumes that the drive's already Lux encrypted. Can you also do Lux encryption through here or or do, is that still a thing you have to do yourself? If like if you had a new disk you wanted to make sure it was Lux encrypted. Yeah, as far as far as I know, you you have to do the uh, Lux encryption for the root file system at install time. Um, I'm not I'm not sure if we have a supported method to take one that's not encrypted and, and and do the Lux encryption after the fact. So, so this is something, you know, I definitely recommend, you know, if you're, if you're, when you're building new systems, um, you know, new rail systems, consider, you know, consider doing the Lux encryption and utilizing the network bound disencryption technology right. to make that, to make that whole process, you know, super easy. And like you mentioned, right. we have, we have the system, there's two system roles. There's a network bound disencryption client system role and a server system role. And so, you know, if you if you want to deploy this, you know, at a large scale across your environment, the system roles, um, you know, can can really make that easier to do at scale. And the web console makes it really easy to do if you're if you're doing it on you know, individual systems. Um, you, you, so you, you're kind of covered either way, you know, however you want to do it. Right. 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 That's that's a nice addition. And then, you know, while we're talking about <clears throat> security, um, one one important change in in uh, the 8.8, I'm sorry. So this, the, <laughs> let me back up a little bit. So one important change in the 9.2 beta is that we no longer, um, by default, permit root the root login account, the root <laughs> the root account to log into the web console um, directly, right? So you're probably familiar with RHEL 9. Um, mm -hmm. We for SSH, we also disabled the root account from logging in over SSH using a password. So this is kind of in line with that. So this only applies um, to new 9.2 and later um, web console installations. Um, and by default, there's a, there's a new file under, I can show this, let me jump down to the terminal. Um, so let's go over to root. We have a new file here called um, 
the uh, disallowed users. Okay. Hmm. So, so if you are on a 9.2 system and you install um, the cockpit web server, it's going to have this file with uh, the root file, the root user account listed by default, which will prevent the root account from logging in. Now, if you'd like to allow the root account to log in for whatever reason, you can go in and edit this file, you know, delete that line, and it will be allowed. This this uh, this is not going to change by default in RHEL 8. And this will also not change if you're on like a 9.0 or 9.1 system and you upgrade to 9.2. Um, this will not change by default. So this is really only going to affect you um, if you're doing a new um, cockpit web server install on 9.2 or later. You'll see this um, see this in there. Of course, if, you're, if you are doing an upgrade from like 9.0 and 9.1 to 9.2, you can go in and edit this file and add root account if you'd like to. We just didn't want to um, you know, for people who have existing installations, we didn't want to make this a disruptive yeah. change. So absolutely. All right. So, so the file will exist if you upgrade. It just won't have anything in it. Yeah, or you, or you, or will you have to create the file? Yeah, I think you'll, I think you'll have to go in and create the file. Um, okay. But, that but it, sense. but it would, you know, you could create the file list out root, and then you would have that, you know, the ability to block the root account, which is, um, you know, going to be a best practice for sure. If you, if you right, and that's that's helpful for any account. Of course, that you wouldn't right. want to log into the web console, right? right? If you had for some reason, like some right. super user account or some special account, or maybe you've got an automation account that you don't want people to log into directly, you could put that in here. Exactly. Exactly. Um, all right, cool. And then just a couple more new things. There's a lot, lots of new stuff in the beta. So, <laughs> so uh, a couple, couple of things I'll mention. Um, you know, jumping over to the Podman containers um, uh, area of, of the web console. So, um, you know, we, we, before we had this create container button, so you could create a, a Podman container, but we now have the ability to create a pod as well. So a pod is a, you know, basically, a, a you know, one or more containers, right? So it's a container a of, of containers almost. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so, so, so you, you, you now have this create pod button. So if you click on this, um, you know, I'll give it a name, just uh, test this pod um you can you know do things like you know configure the port mapping and volumes if you'd like let's go and click on create so once you've created the pod you then have the ability to create one or more containers within that pod so this you know the the pod you know construct or idea it, this is not new to, to podman this has been available in podman mm -hmm. for you know i think since the beginning but um, you just couldn't, you know, manage the 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 pods from Web Console until until this uh, beta release. So, pretty pretty cool that that's in there. And while we're here, I'll just touch on, you know, some of the other functionality that's available here. So, you know, you can you can go ahead and download um, container images if you'd like. So, um, I can click on download a new image. You know, search for you know, for example the UBI universal base image image from, from Red Hat. And this is going to search whatever container registries you have configured on, on the system. And you can easily you know go through here and find whatever image you're looking for and um, and get that downloaded. And then you can you know very easily create um, create new containers as well. So let me click on create container here. Um, so you know, I can specify what image I'd like to use. I'm going to use the, the universal base image, eight image, um, specify things like the memory limit, CPU shares. If you go over to the integration. What command it runs. Yeah, okay. yeah, exactly. Yeah, what command it runs, yep. Yeah. Um, if you jump over to integration, you can do things like, you know, port mappings, volumes, um, define environment variables. And then you can even define a health check um, command to run. So this will this will run the command within the container and then report. Right. You know, here if if the container is considered healthy based on based on the output of this command, that's good because you know these are all things you can do with the Podman command line. But if you don't know they exist or you haven't dug into that piece, right, you might not even know how to do them. So it's, exactly. it's handy to have this right there in the UI. Exactly. Things like health checks are things that I, I'd only recently started looking into. I kind of was vaguely aware they were there, but you know, if it was right there in front of me when I made the container, yep. it's the thing I might have thought about sooner. Exactly. So. This this is this is nice. It um, I, I I like the the ability to manage them. There's there's still some more advanced advanced features that that I haven't really seen, but 
I'm sure this is this is growing in the same way that uh, let say the virtual the virtual machines piece has grown, right? Yeah. yeah, and yeah, and what you know what's cool too is like once you once you have you know your list of containers running here too, like you can go through and do things like you know if you want to access the console within the That's within nice the too. within the container, you know, like I, I'm now in a in a console within within the the container, so it's super super easy to go through and like if you want to see like you know, how much memory is this using, how much CPU, et cetera. It's just really easy to monitor and see at a glance what, you know, what's going on, on on the system. So. Right. Right. And, and again, right. That's, that's a thing that you'd probably be looking at top to find out. Right. right. Now here it is right here in front of you in, in the UI where you'd expect to find it within Podman instead of having to go look at over the overall system performance to try to find it. Right. Exactly. That's, that's nice. Yeah. And then, and then the final, the final new thing I want to show, in line with with the performance, it, you know, if you go over to the to the overview, um, you have this usage card here. This is showing kind of like the the real time CPU memory, but you can also go to you know view metrics and history, and see a more in depth look at um, what's going on um, from a performance stand, standpoint. So, um, you know, we have the the CPU here. You can see you know see information on what the CPU is doing, what the what the top services are that are using CPU, you know, memory, the top services using memory, um, and then your and then your disk uh, throughput. Now one thing that's new in uh, 9.2 beta and 8.8 beta is this view per disk throughput. So if I click on this, it's going to list out all the different storage devices I have on the system and then show me the throughput for you know each individual device. So this is super cool. Like if you're, you know, troubleshooting a, a system and there's a, you know, like a, a, a bottleneck with a, a particular disk device, um, right. you know, this make it really easy to go in and see, you know, which which devices are getting hit the hardest, uh, you know, et cetera. So earlier on, I, I, when I talked about TuneD, I said I was troubleshooting a performance problem on my hypervisor. It was disk. <laughs> it's almost like you knew that yeah. it was it was uh, it was my Synology uh, was choking on something. And so the iSCSI disk was slow and this would have pointed me right to it. <laughs> yeah. And, this, and the, you know, like in one of my systems, I have, you know, one one drive that's a, you know, a, like a, a magnetic disk drive. And I have one that's a solid state drive. Right. And so they have mm -hmm. vastly different capabilities. So, yeah. you know, it, it's it's very useful to be coming here and look and, you know, compare, you know, between devices, what, you know, what's going on as far as the throughput. Um, and then if we scroll down here, so, you know, kind of this, this upper section here is all about real time statistics. And then down here, um, if you enable the, the, the um, cockpit performance copilot um, uh, plugin, you can see, yeah. you can see this historical information. So this is, you know, the performance from earlier today and you know you can see CPU memory, um, disk I/O, and network. And you know one thing that's really cool is um, you know if there's a a spike in like the CPU or network, um, the web console will make a note of that over here, and then um, you can expand expand these drop downs, and you can see log entries that occurred around the time of that resource spike, which may or may not be related. You know, but it, but it can be a good starting point to say, you know, what what was going on in the system right around the time that this resource uh, spiked, um, and you know, it can be a useful place right. to start, start troubleshooting. Because that's exactly what you'd be looking for, right? Yep. And it's it's great that that's that's right there, right where you right where you would expect, yep. or I, I shouldn't even say where you'd expect it. Uh, the fact that someone had the forethought to say, you're probably going to want this next, and here it is, right? Yep. Like I wouldn't have expected that, I, but noticing it there is is really nice. Yeah, and this is another area, you, you know, that we've been doing a particular focus on with the web console is is performance stuff because the feedback we hear constantly from you know from from rel users is and, and it's, it's just that you know it's hard to troubleshoot these performance issues, right? It and is. so and so we're we're trying to make the web console you know a, a great place to be able to to dive into these issues and, and figure out what's going on with the system and performance issues. So, yeah, I mean, as, uh, as a sysadmin performance, Oh, it feels slow, right? Like <laughs> you, you dread, you dread that, that ticket. Why is the application slow? Yeah. Oh crap. <laughs> now I got to go dig into it. Right. And yeah. not only does this help you identify if there is a problem, 
but it gives you historical data that says, nope, it's always been that slow. You're just maybe haven't had a second cup of, cup of coffee yet, and you right. think it should be faster. <laughs> So that's that's all the that's all the new stuff in the beta. But I wanted to go through and kind of highlight some some other stuff in the web console. Um, sure. So I'm just going to go down the list here and kind of hit, hit the highlights of, of the stuff we haven't talked about yet. So you know, if you go to the logs area here, um, you can very easily see the system logs. What what I really like is you can go through and filter, you know, based on the the, the priority of the alerts. So if you want to see only, you know critical and above, you can click that and, and just kind of filter this down um, and, and see, you know, what, what exactly you're looking for as far as logs. So pretty cool there. Um, the storage area, you know, one thing that I find really useful is, um, you know, the ability to go in here and like expand volume groups, expand file systems. Um, you know, during my time as a system administrator, you know, working with with database administrators, they were always wanting more space, right? I spent a ton of time expanding file systems and growing growing volume groups. So if you need to do that from the web console, like I can go in here um, on on this volume group, right? Um, and you can see like here's here's my root file system, right? Um, mm -hmm. If I want to grow this, you can see it's telling me, you know, hey, the volume group's full, so I can't. Right. I can't add, but but I can go over here to physical volumes, click the plus sign, and I have a couple of available disk um, on, on the system. So I can just click on the disk I'd like to add to the volume group. Okay, so I'm gonna click those two, add. And you'll notice my volume group increased in size. So I now have these disk in there. And I can now click on grow on the file system. And I can just you know drag this over however large I'd like it to be, click on grow, and it's literally that easy to expand a volume group and expand the root file system. Now, wow, you... it's, it's it's almost like you don't have to be stressed out while uh, <laughs> yeah. while working with disks anymore, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. If you, I mean, if you do this from the command line, like it, it it it's 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 definitely more complicated. There's definitely a lot more room to mess things up. You know, if you're mm -hmm. in the command line, like if it. This is just so much easier to do. So. Oh yeah, the 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 possibility of typos is so right. easy. Uh, when you're when you're dealing with you know LVM has made this stuff uh, I shouldn't necessarily say easier but possible right, right. I mean w w without LVM growing a disk like that wasn't wasn't really all that easy in fact right. it may not have even been possible at all right but there's a lot of pieces where you have to make sure you put in the right commands and you, one little typo and it's oh I grew the disk by exponentially larger than I intended right, <laughs> right? or something like that. Exactly. Yeah, it's, and it's always stressful, you know. If you're if you're on a production system and you need to expand yeah. the file system, like yeah. You, you, yeah. you don't want to mess things up, you know. So if there's a tool available like this that can make it easier, then you know you should you should definitely consider using it. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and one other thing I'll point out: so on, on a lot of these pages, like I'm on the storage page still, they'll, they'll follow a similar format where you know up here at the top we have some performance some, statistics, yeah. you know, we have the file systems and stuff laid out, and at the bottom we have storage related logs, and so. If we jump down to networking, yeah, I was going to say networking has the same thing. Yeah, I you'll see the, you'll see the same thing. So we'll, at the top, we'll see networking related performance statistics here, and at the bottom, we'll see the network logs. So you know, very handy. Um, now, you know, an, another common thing you're going to do as a system admin is probably work with the the firewall, right? So we, we can go in here. Mm -hmm. You know, say I want to add add a new service um, to, to my uh, firewall configuration. I can just click on add service here, um, go through and find, you know, whatever, whatever right. service I'd like to, like to enable. Um, like for example, uh, we'll just pick satellite. Let's click on add service here. And it's now opened up these ports in the firewall. And then if I right. you know, change my mind, and just click delete, just remove that hey. out of Move that it out. looked like there was a tab to do it. Uh, you could add a custom port if it's not already in the list. So that's good yes. too. Yeah. So you can do a custom port. So yeah, right. if you want to, um, you know, add, you can list out a range of uh, ports or individual ports if you'd like to. So. Right. Right. And then, and then we mentioned earlier, you know, like when, when you're talking about virtual machines and stuff, uh, you know, setting up like a, a network team or bond, you know, right. so much or VLAN <laughs> or bridge. Yeah. And, and so, okay, so just looking at the list, so we talked about Podman, we talked about virtual machines, we talked about accounts. Um, let's go down to services. 
So the services uh, section here is all about like the, the system D services. Mm -hmm. So if you want to go in and like um, enable a service, let me, let me type in SSHD here. So, you know, we can go through, we can see that this is, is running and enabled. We could, we could stop and disable it. Um, we could uh, restart SSH. I'll go ahead and restart it. Um, and then down here, you can see the, the log entries specific for the SSH uh, service. So really easy to manage services. Um, you can also do things like manage the system D timers. Um, and something, like uh, something I noticed while working with networking was if I was about to make a change that was going to break my connection to the web console, it'll come up and warn me. Like if I'm working with the system's oh, nice. base interface, right? And it'll come up and it'll say, hey, you're about to lock yourself out or not lock yourself out specifically, but you're about to cut your connection off right? right. if you make this change. And I thought that was really nice. Is is that built into things like services? Like if I tried to stop the cockpit service, would it warn me? <laughs> you know, that's... Or I should say the socket. It's a good question. You know, it's a good question. I'm not, not sure if I want to try it right now. But <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, not live on the air. I guess I, I was just kind of curious. Maybe it's a feature request if, if it's not yeah, already in there. Yeah, right? yeah, let it, yeah, try it out and let me know. How, how it works. Yeah. So, all right, so this is looking at the time. So I'll, I'll, I'll go through the rest of these really really quick since we're almost out of time. Yeah. But, um, you know, session recording, um, this is a functionality in RHEL where you can set it up to, you know, record what people are doing from the command line. You can go through and play those back here in the web console. Um, Applications. This is where you can, you know, we mentioned earlier that Web Console is modular. So, mm -hmm. like, if I don't want to use Podman, um, I can just remove that, and it would remove it from the menu and, and uninstall the yeah. package that's that supports. And, and and notice, there's not. Uh, you, you kind of touched on this, but we didn't really delve into it at all. There's there's these plugins, right, for Web Console. Um, you you mentioned performance, right? PCP. You have to have PCP up and running on the machine. But in order to get that talking to Web Console, it's just a matter of adding the plugin. There's no like, okay, now I have to go and configure it. It's just right. I install yep. the plugin, there it is. Same thing with virtualization. You install the plugin, yep. it sees libvirt, it starts talking to it. Right. Yeah, there's exactly. no there's no yeah. like, okay, now I gotta put in authentication. Right. I gotta do right. this, I can do that. It just you put in the plugin and it's working. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, there's a lot of places in the web console. Like if you go and you don't have the the performance copilot installed, it'll just write there prompt you like do you want to install this? You click, click install, and like you're saying, you know, it's it installs it, and then and then it's available. So you know, extremely right. extremely easy to use. Um, diagnostic reports. This is how you create an SOS report using the web console. So you can click run report. Um, you know, configure this. This will generate the SOS report. You can download it. Um, this is frequently used when you're working with you know Red Hat support, like with a support case. They'll ask you for a SOS report, and um, you can generate that. Yeah. Right there. Kernel dump. Just make, um, just make the SOS report, SOS report, folks. Just make it, upload it to the case. <laughs> They're going to ask you for it. <laughs> yeah. That, yeah, exactly. It's not a stall tactic. They need right. it. <laughs> yeah. It is very helpful when, when they're troubleshooting. Yeah. Sure. I've been there. Uh, yeah, kernel crash uh, dump. So, you know, this is a, a functionality in, in, in RHEL. So if there's a kernel panic, it can, it can uh, write out some information that can help support, yep. again, you know, determine what, what happened. Um, SE Linux, this is really cool. This will show you, you know, different S SE Linux um, access control of errors and events that have occurred on the system. Um, and it'll, you know, help you determine, um, you know, what's going on and, and, you know, suggestions for how you might resolve that issue. So it's super, super helpful if you're um, troubleshooting SE Linux. Um, software updates, you know, so this will show you if there are available updates for the system and allow you to install them. So that's um, mm -hmm. yeah, extremely, extremely cool. Um, we also, in a, a couple of releases ago, enabled the ability to install live kernel patches from the web console. So, so if you wanna use live kernel patching, you can do that from here as well. Right, um, good stuff. Subscriptions, um, you know, you can go in and do things like make sure you're connected to insights, um, subscribe to the system, et cetera. I found a bug, Brian. Yeah, that looks like we your dark mode. <laughs> I know. Yeah, I noticed on the, the session recording and the subscriptions. Yeah. Yeah. We need to. We need to. We need to take care of that. Yeah, reported. This and is then, why it's a beta. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and then finally, you know, the terminal. You know, we we have a ton of functionality in the web console all over the place. But if there is something you can only do from the command line, 
you can just click yeah. on demo here and you have yeah. access to a regular a regular shell and you can run you know run any command you'd like to so all right well that that puts us at the top of the hour here so that is that is the web console it does it does so, all right i guess we'll, we'll wrap up the show so uh brian let's just say somebody watched this episode and they're like i really really need to enable web console all over the place is there a quick easy way to get that done yeah there is actually a system role for um cockpit so so yeah that if you want to i'm sorry <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah so if you want to deploy this across your environment um check out the the, the cockpit system role um one one thing that's cool too is we have a, a certificate system role that can go out and and uh, request certificates from uh, the red hat identity management system and so i have a blog out there where you can use the cockpit role in conjunction with the certificate role to um basically roll out web console with um with certificates issued from IDM, because by default, Cockpit's going to use um, self signed certificates, self -signed. which, you, which yeah. you probably don't probably don't want to use in your environment. So yeah, you know, I mean, it's 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 nice that it it, it encrypts it out of out of the gate, but uh, yeah, you definitely want to switch to something that's uh, yeah. trusted. So, so if you have ID, uh, identity management in your environment, check check that out. It, it'll automate the whole process of getting um, certificates issued from IDM and and set up within within the web console. So. All right. Well, this has been a great tour of not just the new features, but web console in general. Um, folks, thanks for watching. And uh, if you want to watch this show or the Into the Terminal show, which happens every Friday, you should subscribe to the channel. Make sure you subscribe, like the the episode if you like it, and feel free to give us any any comments or feedback uh, in the just you know in the comments at the bottom of this thing. So, uh, thanks, Brian. I think this has been great. Got any any last words before we end the stream? No, yeah, no, thank, thanks so much, Nate. Thanks for everyone for watching. Hope, hope you all have a great day. All right, everybody, have a good one. We'll see you, well, I'll see you Friday on Into the Terminal. We'll be talking about logical volume management, not through the web console, though. So, sorry, Brian. <laughs> all right, folks, you have a good one.